My name is Marina Sweet and this is my Global Capstone um, FAES 4580 final presentation on comparing organic animal agriculture in varying climates and cultures. The reason I chose this topic is because I did not come from an agricultural background growing up in a Detroit suburb and then moving to London, Ohio when I was 10 years old, which is where I got involved in 4-H and then started working on farms and got really, I became really passionate about agriculture, specifically livestock, with livestock, um, particularly the dairy industry. And so um, this topic to me, organic agri livestock farming um, around the world is something that I was inspired by from my experiences while studying abroad. Um, but I also note that propagandized media frustrates me to no end. Um, so this is where a lot of um, consumers, when they go to the store and are buying something, there's a lot of different um, information out there, different packaging and labels, um, and organic agriculture is um, one of those and one of those labeled items and a form of agriculture that gets a lot of media attention today. And then also, I think that people, with, on that subject, people should have the opportunity to make an informed decision about what they are buying and consuming while they're at the store, um, preferably without propagandized media and just having the facts. And so again, my study abroad experiences exposed me to a multitude of different ways of farming and helped me learn that um, agriculture around the world a lot of times is different based on the resources that a um, country has, the climate, the cultural opinions, um, different breeds of livestock, things like that. And so my study abroad's really opened my mind to that and um, kind of inspired me to delve further into uh, the subject I chose for this presentation. So agriculture today, as a whole, civilization is founded on agriculture. We would not have communities um, and a population as large as we have today if we did not have agriculture. Um, crop and animal farming feed the entire population and today less than 2% of people are involved in agriculture and that 2% of people feed the entire population, which is just astounding to me. The vast minority is feeding the vast majority. Um, the demand for livestock products uh, is driven by population growth, income growth, income growth, and urbanization. So as population, as the population grows, more people are demanding animal-based uh, proteins. Mm -hmm. As in, as people's incomes grow, when people have more expendable income to spend on food, they are choosing to buy animal-based protein for, and they're choosing to buy um, better nutrition. So with more with better income and more income comes um, more demand for livestock products. And urbanization, as people uh, move into urban areas, they are buying from grocery stores rather than growing it themselves, and they have the option to um, buy more of it because they're not just raising it themselves based on their own resources. Um, last, as people have more wealth, like I said, there's a higher demand for animal protein. So um, there's two graphs I have here. The top one is evolution in protein consumption per capita. And so there's three different colored lines. The blue line shows um, the entire world. The red line is for developed countries and the green line is for developing countries. So as you can see, all three of these lines have increased. So um, overall, the entire world, including developed and developing countries have increased in their demand for animal-based protein. Um, but if you look, developed countries have kind of plateaued. It's still high and slightly increasing, but it has mostly plateaued over the last um, 30 to 40 years, whereas developing countries have a pretty uh, steeper slope of the line there where it's still increasing today. Um, and then down here, there's three scenarios. This is from a uh, research project done by Henshin and his coworkers, um, where it's examining existing population at current consumption levels but increased population at average protein consumption for three different um, subjects. Developing world, for the whole world, and um, developed world, so again, comparing the three that we talked about up here, and overall, they're all projected to increase between 30 and 40% in the next um, some odd years. I guess I don't see where it says that there, but it's still increasing and will continue to do so. So then we move on into trends in agriculture. So people in developed countries have the luxury of choosing very specifically what they eat. And this is where consumers going to the grocery store are able to choose what it is they want to buy based on their own um, personal uh, opinions and perceptions. So food trends will occur as a result of multiple things. Um, nutritional and health studies that are released 
uh, have driven demand. So um, I know in the past there was a nutritional study that talked about cholesterol and that cholesterol was bad. And that was a time when egg production or egg sales at the store um, dropped significantly because people were uh, afraid of the amount of cholesterol they were consuming with eggs. Um, new nutritional studies have come out since then, uh, not disproving the fact that eggs have a lot of cholesterol, but uh, delving further into good and bad cholesterol. So that's just one example um, of health studies and nutritional studies that have impacted food trends. Also, food label propaganda. There's a lot of um, information out there that leads consumers into believing things that may or may not be true or are exaggerated. So, for example, um, the label on chicken products that say, like, no hormones added. Well, it is illegal to use hormones in raising poultry pro or raising meat uh, chicken. And so putting that on a label is just extra information that costs money to put on a label. So perhaps a smaller producer wouldn't put on their label, but their chicken still also isn't raised with hormones. So it's just one of those things that I think is somewhat unnecessary. But if the general population was educated on the fact that meat chicken does not have hormones at race at all, no matter whether, whether or not the label says it or not, um, it just comes down to like what they know. And so I think that food label propaganda is very frustrating and something that we could perhaps um, as a whole, as a food industry, do a little bit better about. Um, I do understand that it is a way to sell a product and it's marketing strategies, but also at what point is it too far um, and too misleading for the consumer. And then last thing is misconceptions. So um, there's a lot of trends and labeling that I just talked about with um, food label propaganda that lead to misconceptions or are sprung from misconceptions. And so if we can just eliminate some of those misconceptions, be a little bit more transparent and help the consumer actually know these things and learn them, um, maybe we wouldn't have as much of an issue at the store when people are buying. Um, current food trends in the U.S. that kind of outlined some things that I notice in, um, personally when I'm at the grocery store, which is organic, which I will delve into a lot with this presentation based on my subject. Um, Non-GMO, raised with no antibiotics, hormone-free, quotes, hormone-free, and pasture-based, free-range, cage-free, that kind of product. So moving on to organic agriculture, which is the main focus of this presentation. Um, an organic food trend that has emerged in the United States is organic um, and USDA certified organic is the United States certification that has very strict guidelines about um, how food can, how food is raised and the land that is used on it and the feed that's given to animals and um, also includes regulations on treatment protocols um, and if animals can receive antibiotics or not um, that kind of thing and so this to um, some consumers who have kind of um, gone into you know, buying more organic. It's something that I think is founded in a lot of misconceptions, but also people have the liberty to choose what they want to eat at the store. So overall, um, I think the opinion and what drives food trends and specifically organic agriculture is that people are seeking safe to eat ethically raised animal products. Um, and products are being marketed competitively with the food label propaganda and um, a lot of the options that are out there that the consumers are seeing when they go to buy their food. So tying this into my study abroad experience, um, I've gone on four different study abroad trips over the last two years. It was a lot in a very short period of time. Um, in December 2015 into January, I went on a human-animal interactions trip to Ireland. The following May of 2016, I went on the exotic animal behavior and welfare trip to South Africa. Then the following December, I went on another human-animal inter interactions trip to New Zealand, and my last trip was in May of 2017. It was the European Dairy Studies trip to uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany. And so on these individual trips, I was able to visit a lot of farms, a lot of animal facilities, observe human-animal human interactions, as well as learn a lot about their ways of agriculture and farming. So in Ireland, we've visited multiple different of uh, these animal operations as well as tourist sites, um, places like the University College Dublin. So um, had a pretty well-rounded experience. None of the farms we visited were organic. So that was, um, in with this project here concluding, I don't have much firsthand experience with Ireland's organic um, dairy farming or organic farming. Um, this here is a picture from a dairy farm that we visited and what I want to note about this dairy farm and a lot of the other farms that we visited is that most animal operations in Ireland are pasture based because they have um, a rainy season that pretty much feeds into the 
um, which the climate has an impact on, but they have a lot of lush grass and it makes sense for them to use this as a resource for their farming. So during the rainy season, um, to protect the animals and the pasture from being torn up from animals being on it, animals are housed indoors. So aside from that period where they're housed indoors, um, pasture access is a really main part of organic farming. It's something that is required to be um, USDA certified as organic, um, specifically with dairy farming in this case. And so um, I'd like to note that Ireland, while I didn't visit any organic operations, there are organic farms there and their overall um, climate and way of farming is pretty conducive to organic um, standards based on the pasture access. Next, I visited um, South Africa, and while, we, while I was there, we visited primarily wildlife-related um, organizations and attractions like Kruger National Park and Elephant Sanctuary and Jessica Hippo. And so none of these um, really played into the organic uh, topic either. We did tour one poultry processing facility and a dairy farm, um, which I was surprised at how similar their practices were to the United States, maybe just... Um, a little bit behind on the times, just still similar though um, to what we have had um, practice-wise in the past and even somewhat now. Um, and while none of them were organic, there was also no mention of organic farming in South Africa. So I, I did a little bit of research um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later um, in my presentation, but I did not personally learn anything about organic agriculture on this trip, which, may, which led me to believe that it's not a big part of their culture. Um, and so that's something I took away from that trip. Next, my trip to New Zealand. This is a picture of a dairy farm we visited there. Um, we, visit, we visited a variety of tourist style attractions, um, sheep and cattle farms, and then historical and cultural sites. This uh, trip was um, really similar to Ireland in the practices. They use a lot of the grazing-based technology where they have um, rotational uh, pastures. The only difference between New Zealand and Ireland in this case is that they don't have a rainy season where they take animals off of pasture. They are on pasture pretty much year round. Um, so most of the farms there are, we call that extensive, where they're on pasture and um, pretty hands-off operation, similar to the way we raise beef in the United States, uh, aside from feedlots. And they utilize that grassland. So once again, like Ireland, New Zealand has a lot of opportunity to um, kind of buy into that organic practice where they have to have pasture access. Um, once again, none of the farms that we visited, as I recall, were organic farms. And last, my study abroad experience in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany on my European dairy studies trip. Um, we visited a wide variety of dairy farms and processing facilities. Not all of them were cow dairies. We visited a horse dairy, a goat dairy, and a sheep dairy as well. So um, once again, broadening my views of agriculture around the world as there are uh, many different opportunities. Um, we did visit several organic and conventional dairies on this trip. And so fortunately, I was able to compare and see and take away some things from that. And so um, organic farms in Europe have uh, different regulations than those enforced by USDA certified organic because the European Union is um, a little bit more advanced on animal welfare and organic standards in this case. Um, and I think that their practices are something that we could certainly take something away from uh, and utilize and maybe implement here in the United States. It would just take some time to implement that. And so what I took away from this trip is that their organic farming in Europe is um, a little bit less strict on the treatment guidelines. So in the United States, um, animals on organic farms are not allowed to receive antibiotics as treatment at all, ever, um, despite the fact that no meat product or food product from animals ever reaches a store um, with antibiotics in it. So um, in the United States, our uh, processing regulations, uh, all the meat and d dairy products and eggs and everything are tested for antibiotic residues and um, farms can get in a lot of trouble for having that. So I'm getting on a tangent here saying that um, antibiotics never actually make it into food, but with the organic standard in the United States, they're not allowed to receive organic or receive antibiotics for anything. On the other hand, in Europe, their organic standard doesn't um, disallow any antibiotics. Rather, they allow the treatment of a sick animal, but only in a certain concentration of your entire herd. So in only a certain percentage of animals can be treated and the animal can only be treated so many times and again under a certain threshold of a drug. And so what I like about this is that 
to me, if, if an animal gets sick, they should be allowed to be treated and get, and get better if it's something that can be treated. So same thing as uh, if a person, um, their child gets sick, they take them to the doctor and get the medicine and they get better. So the same thing goes for animals, I think. So in Europe, where they allow treatment just in minimal concentrations, um, to me, that's better animal welfare than what we are doing in the United States, where um, if an animal gets sick, gets sick, it's not allowed to be given antibiotics and still maintain organic standard. So some farmers in the United States manage to work around this, where they will um, own two different farms where one's organic and one's conventional on the organic farm if an animal gets sick they treat it and send it to the conventional farm to me that's a great strategy but if we wanted to um, maintain or if someone a smaller farmer only has an organic operation the european um, ideals makes a little bit more sense to me and is something that i really appreciated when i learned about that on my study abroad so next i'm going to talk about my research and what i found about organic agriculture by region in the world and so first I'm gonna talk about North America, which includes the United States and Canada. Then I'm gonna move on to Central and South America. So that includes Mexico, other small Central American countries and everything all the way down through the South American continent. Um, then I'm gonna move on to uh, Europe, talk a little bit about Africa as a whole, even though there's some um, pretty different countries and standards of living and ways of farming in the, in the um, continent as a whole. Then I'm going to talk about Asia. I exclude Russia a little bit, but I'm including it in the circle here um, as a region. And then finally, I'm going to talk about um, islands. And so that will include most of Oceania, Australia, New Zealand, um, Polynesia, all of that. So first things first, North America. I've already talked quite a bit about the United States um, for obvious reasons. And so in the U.S., total organic sales hit $43.3 billion in 2015, up, in, up an entire 11% in just one year. So that kind of gives a perspective on how quickly organic agriculture has grown and is continuing to grow. Um, and it is um, a pretty big trend that I think we'll see continue to escalate in the years to come. Many regulations have been passed and will continue to be refined by the USDA. And so fortunately, the United States has a lot of these standards in place already and a lot of farmers are able to um, feed into this niche market and raise organic um, livestock to uh, fill the need and make a little bit more money as we know organic products are quite a bit more expensive because they are more expensive um, to raise the feeds more expensive um, overall it just costs more so it's great that farmers are able to um, make more money by f um, fulfilling the organic uh, demand in the United States and then uh, we're also seeking international trade markets, so um, places to sell organic products as well as um, import them. And for Canada, uh, most of the research I was able to find, find was pretty general, just saying that um, now 56% of Canadians regularly buy organic. So over half of the population in Canada is regularly purchasing organic products. For Central and South America, some of the things I found, um, also a positive trend of growing organic sector. And so in a span of five years, um, up through 2014, organic production in South America as a whole increased 66%. Five years and 66%, that's uh, just incredible. That's so fast and so much growth in just a span of five years. Um, a public policy has been developed in the last 10 years pertaining to organic agriculture. And then um, focusing a little bit more on Central America, Mexico, um, Peru, and Paraguay down here um, are, top, are the top three organic producers in general, respectively. So Mexico is the most, Peru is the next most, and then Paraguay is the third most um, in Central and South America for organic agriculture. And then finally, there are some difficulties in, in feeding organic livestock uh, in Central and South America because most operations are pasture-based due to the low availability of organic feed. And so um, I talked a bit more earlier about Ireland and New Zealand and on my trips how I noticed that pasture-based is conducive to um, organic agriculture, but we have to remember the climate and the differences here where like, yes, they need pasture, but they also need to supplement um, with other organic feed, which for them is apparently hard to access. Um, next, for Europe, uh, between 2007 and 2015, so another um, fairly short <coughs> time span, um, organic poultry and eggs increased 108%. 108%. So it more than doubled in a span of uh, six years here. And so organic beef and dairy cattle increased 58%. Organic sheep increased 35%. 
organic goats increased 15%, and organic milk production has doubled. All of these livestock markets for organic products has more has um, has increased in between 2007 and 2015, which is just astounding at how quickly that grows. And that has to do with both internal demand and exports. So um, one thing I also found is that Turkey has the most organic producers. So down here, um, European Union as a whole falls second in global retail sales of organic products, falling only second to the United States. So the U.S. and the European Union are the two top organic um, like organic countries for, or well, the European Union is not a country, but they're the two um, highest in retail sales of organic products, so within the country. Um, and then the European organic market grew by 13% in 2015, so um, as a whole, the market grew by that much, and the demand for all these, um, or in the production of all of these livestock uh, also increased. So overall, organic agriculture is just um, increasing by and large in Europe. Next up is Africa. Um, fairly recent significant achievement achieved by AfroNet, which is the organic umbrella organization in Africa. They kind of puts forth some of the regulations and um, information for um, Africa as a whole. Organic farming is projected to increase, um, so from where it is now and in the future. Um, not so much for internal demand of the of uh, people in the country, but rather so that they can satisfy the market, the global economy, and the de current demand for organic agriculture. Um, most likely leaning towards the European Union and the United States, as we know, um, they have the highest global retail sales and demand. And that um, is more of a niche market, and they're doing that to make more money. So their people. Um, can be benefit, benefited from that, not so much because they want organic products raised, but rather because it brings in more income for them, um, for their families, and for them to grow their farms. And finally, organic farming integrates um, traditional farming methods in Africa, and so um, those traditional farming methods typically do not use a lot of medication. They are fairly pasture-based and extensive, um, and those methods are uh, that are already used in African countries are pretty easy to convert to um, and comply with organic standards, um, particularly those in the US and the European Union. Um, finally, or this one for Asia, um, India, China, and Sri Lanka have all made significant commitments to organic movements. So that's something that we'll probably see growing in those countries uh, in the near future. And then small scale organic farming is typical in these countries. So um, while they do have large farms to produce conventional food, um, organic is still pretty small operations. And then the government is currently involved in regulating that and, and uh, will continue to be. And that seems to be a pretty general trend with these countries. Um, and then finally, challenges uh, with organic farming in, in these countries has to do with poor literacy, high cost, and small land holding. And I know a lot of that um, comes from India as well. And um, specifically with India, 0.1% of total agricultural land is used for organic production. 0.1%. So very small. Um, these countries are not quite um, where the United States and the European Union are uh, as far as organic production currently. And then uh, I did find that India recently gained um, equivalence for the USDA regulation, the National Organic Program, which kind of oversees all the organic production in the United States, as well as the European Union organic standards. So they have um, ma managed to... Uh, gain that equivalence. So what that means to me is that they will be able to export and sell and market their organic products to the European Union or European Union and the United States um, as certified organic. Island nations. So all are increasing uh, development of organic, cult organic agricultural land currently. Some challenges with this is keeping up with disease and sanitation standards that comply with organic standards. So um, in Australia, particularly, the government currently accredits six organic certifying organizations, which to me sounds like a lot, as the United States only has um, USDA certified organic. So six different organic certifying organizations um, in Australia, which is pretty cool. And then the Pacific Islands um, in general, they have current practices which are largely organic based because they're using old systems. So kind of like in um, Africa, when I just talked about how they also have kind of older traditional farming methods that are more compliant with organic standards because they don't really use antibiotics or pesticides, they just farm. 
Um, and then fi and last thing about the Pacific Islands is that uh, in addition to organic um, potentially growing here in the future, they also take part in fair trade programs as well. So organic livestock farming worldwide, the United States is the leader in demand for organic animal products. Um, also, like we talked about earlier, the first in global retail sales to fill that demand. And then Europe also has high demand for organic food and is a major producer. The two of them um, still are the highest and will probably continue to be here and in the future. Um, <clears throat> most developing countries don't have a significant internal market for organic products yet, but they do produce to export. These are the overall themes that I've found from my research, um, which makes sense. And in conclusion, uh, developed countries are trending towards higher demand of organic products, um, aside from ones that are already included. Uh, one thing I did note that in my study abroad, all the countries that I visited were developed countries except for, um, or they're developed countries as deemed by the UN, um, aside from South Africa. South Africa is still considered a developing economy according to the United Nations in 2014. So I guess that may have changed. Um, and then on the note of developing countries, they do not have as much internal demand in the countries, but they are adjusting to supply the global market, which while I um, have some opinions about organic agriculture and, and um, whether or not it's actually better that we're shifting towards that or not, um, because personally, I believe that organic agriculture is not sustainable. It's not efficient enough to feed the world's growing population. And while it's great that developing countries are shifting towards producing more to fulfill the need, um, the demand for organic agriculture or ag organic agricultural products, um, specifically animal-based proteins, I worry that in the future they will be producing and exporting so much of that that the market will be somewhat um, satiated and uh, perhaps the food trend, as I called it, will kind of come to a plateau and maybe decline in the future. And what that does is leaves um, these developing countries who are trying to produce this to fill, fill, fulfill the demand, they are still producing organic food, so less efficiently perhaps um, than they could be. And if they lose that market, they're going to lose that income or um, they're gonna be making less food than they could be to feed their people um, or to fulfill just the general market demand for food. So my, that was my roundabout way of saying that I don't think organic agriculture is something that um, necessarily should continue to grow and be the only way that we produce food because it will not feed the entire world's population um, and could potentially hurt countries who are um, farming to fill the market in the future. Um, and then last thing on the note of developing countries as well as other countries that are kind of more geared towards the um, style of farming that organic agriculture requires, um, some climates make it easier to incorporate organic standards. So all in all, this project was something that I um, certainly learned a lot while doing, and I learned a lot about organic agriculture in different countries and kind of where everybody's going right now. Um, that being said, I feel like while I learned a lot, it's still kind of questionable as to where it will be in the future. Um, if they reach a certain point, or like I mentioned before, if the kind of food trend dies down a little bit. Um, but all in all, um, agriculture is there and livestock farming is there as one goal, which is to feed the world. And that is something that I am very passionate about and I feel very honored to be a part of um, and to be dedicating my life to that. So thank you very much for listening. And um, this concludes my final presentation.